Hey everyone, it's Joel, one of the producers for Climate Money Work. I have some good news for you. Kisa is giving away two copies of her book, Corporations, Compassion, Culture, to listeners of the show. That means you. The book is great. I've read it, but you don't have to take my word for it. Seth Godin called it a light for so many organizations, and Daniel Pink called it a really practical guide for diversity and inclusion. Entering takes less than a minute, and you can find a link in the show notes. Okay, back to the show. We are working to try to put ourselves out of a job because when this is fully integrated and done right across the company, it's just within the way that you operate. Are we there yet? No. But I hope at some point within my lifetime that there is not a need for a separate team because it is integrated in every single aspect of the business. Hello, and thank you for joining the Climate Money Work Podcast. I'm Kisa Shreen, and today we have with us Mary Jane Melendez, who's the Chief Sustainability Officer with General Mills. Mary Jane, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me here today. So I'm going to jump right into it and starting off with some of the financials. A recent Yahoo Finance report stated that over the last half decade or so, General Mills has grown its earnings per share at about 3.7% a year. So citing this holistic view may ease concerns that some stakeholder shareholders maybe saw with a share price drop of 12% last quarter. But clearly there are mostly positive views, positive feelings around these earnings. And in context of that, we'd love to start off with the conversations that you might be having with investors and other stakeholders. What are the risks and opportunities you're discussing in developing a sustainability strategy in the CPG industry that can continue to have these types of earnings and, and good success? I'm going to start with the risk side. So we are a company that depends completely on the health and well-being of Mother Nature to, to be in business. She is our most important supplier. And if we don't act to help get this planet back on a trajectory of health, we will not be in business for another 155 years. So there's more risk in not acting today, given the role that we play in our proximity to agriculture. That is the foundation of our business. At the same time, I think there are incredible opportunities in the CPG industry, especially as you think about food we have the opportunity to help drive resilience for people, for our planet, our communities, and our business. This is something, again, where we are absolutely connected and we need to ensure that we have plans in place to help mitigate climate change and to ensure that we are building long-term business resilience as a company that is taking the outputs of mother nature, like oats and wheat and dairy, and then transforming them into great tasting products that are marketed and sold in more than 100 countries around the world. So I think it's a really exciting space to be in as we think about planetary challenges ahead of us. We have not only the opportunity, but I think the great responsibility to act in ways that will help advance planetary health. So speaking of that, going right into the agricultural piece, so very important for you. There was a recent Sustainable Brands article where Jay Watson, your director of regenerative agriculture, mentioned two specific areas related to regenerative agriculture that's very important. Number one, investing in the farmer-led movement to help farmers be successful. And number two, measuring outcomes and impact in the field, at the farm, you know, with the landscape. So with that said, talk us through how regenerative farming is making a difference from that mother nature as our key supply chain, key supplier perspective from diversity, biodiversity, as well as social engagement. We've talked before about the educational component, but then there's a climate and environment component. What are you seeing in terms of that? For me, I believe that the regenerative agriculture space is one of the most promising areas that can help advance planetary health. So I'll give you a little bit of context here. Back in 2019, General Mills was one of the first companies to set a commitment, and that is to advance regenerative agriculture across 1 million acres of farmland by 2030. And for General Mills, that number is significant. It represents between 25 to 30% of um, the acreage it takes to source key ingredients for our products. I'm super proud of the work that Jay and his team have done in this space. We are actually ahead of our goal. We are today advancing regenerative agriculture on more than 500,000 acres. 
And the outcomes that we are starting to see on the farms are promising. I'll give you a few examples. So we are looking at outcomes related to increased biodiversity. So more life in the soil, more life of, above ground. And that could be things like more earthworms, more bugs, more beetles, more birds on the farm. It's been really incredible to see the difference in, in terms of the amount of life that's on a regenerative farm versus maybe standing on a conventionally managed acre right next to that. We are also looking at uh, farmer profitability. And just Monday, we took a, a number of our investors out to a regenerative farm in Redwood Falls, Minnesota. So we took a two hour bus ride, the first time we've ever had investors out on a farm. And we drove to Redwood Falls, Minnesota. It's, it's called Stony Creek Farms. And it was so incredibly powerful to be able to stand in the field and see a regeneratively managed acre that had living roots in the ground, so much plant and crop diversity, the number of bugs and just the pure life that was on that acre. And uh, Shane New, who was one of the farmers, he's with Understanding Ag. This is one of the groups that we engage in to help, help bring in training and education and assistance to our farmers as they're making the change to regenerative agriculture. And Shane had a tool that measured the temperature of the ground and he took a temperature measurement of the bare soil which was 104 degrees and then measured the soil that was covered by all of these different cover crops with the living roots and it was 68 degrees and the look on people's faces when they saw that temperature difference in that regenerative acre was astounding and i think the light bulb went off for folks in terms of what agriculture can do to help drive planetary resilience to help address global warming, soil erosion, the broken water cycles, bro broken nutrient cycles that we're facing today, and think differently about how we might feed future generations in a way that is more in harmony with the natural intelligence of this planet. It was just incredibly powerful to see that. And at General Mills, we have been working with farmers who are in our supply sheds. Those are large areas where we are sourcing key ingredients that we buy a significant amount of, including wheat, oats, dairy. Those are ingredients that have higher greenhouse gas intensity levels. We buy a lot of those ingredients for our products like Cheerios, Nature Valley, haagen ice cream. And what we have learned is that these farmers are starting to see different outcomes on their farm ecosystem, whether it's eagles returning to their the land for, for the first time since these farmers were very, very young, or seeing uh, more bugs come back onto their land. Or we were talking about this in Minnesota, there's a lot of aphids coming out right now. And rather than spraying for aphids, what they do is they wait for these, I think they were called Japanese lady beetles that come in and actually feed on, they're a predator for these beetles. So there's these natural nutrient cycles that they're seeing on their land as they're really kind of paying attention to the power of, of mother nature. And I think that for General Mills, what I really appreciate about the approach that this company is taking is that it's really a farmer led principles based approach. And these principles are global. And these, the, they really work to restore ecosystems and communities that are absolutely critical to our business. So together with our on the ground partners, we both launch or expand programs that offer in, or invite farmers in for training, one-on-one -on -one coaching. We promote peer-to-peer -peer learning, community building. And it was also very powerful on Monday with investors to see this uh, farmer, this regenerative agriculture farmer take a shovel and scoop out a big section of his soil. And it was like moist, beautiful chocolate cake with earthworms and aggregates and root systems. And next door on the neighboring conventionally managed farm that didn't have the regenerative agriculture principles applied. It was drier, it was warmer, and it just it wasn't teeming with life like that regenerative acre was. So it's been really powerful to see these examples come to life and also for farmers to learn from other farmers. We are not the experts in this area. So, I mean, that's amazing. You're talking about educating farmers, but also Mary Jane, there's a difference between having a quarterly call with your institutional investors, shareholders on the call versus getting into a bus, taking a field trip into the farm. 
what has been the feedback from investors who have participated? It's one thing, as I said, to have a conversation. It's another thing to, for them to actually see it. What have investors said? What led up to this? Was there something, an investor conversation that led up to that? And if so, what happened afterwards? Take us into those conversations. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it was a great story. So General Mills happened to be a guest on one of the investors' ESG Day events. And we talked about the work that the company is leading in regenerative agriculture. And we talked about, you know, the number of acres that are advancing, what we're learning, what are some of the challenges and what are the future opportunities as we work to enroll a million acres in our programs. And we were sharing, you know, things that have worked where farmers are, are seeing pressure or where they have societal pressure to not make changes and to continue with the way they're currently farming. So we had a very robust conversation about regenerative agriculture. And at the very end, I said, and while this is great to talk about it, and it's great that I have this, you know, really pretty visual, there's something magical that happens on the farm when you can hear the life, see the life, smell the soil. And, and it's a different experience that I believe so powerfully connects your head and your heart and just gives you a completely different understanding and deep appreciation for what these farmers are doing on their ecosystems to help heal our planet. They are amazing heroes that are both helping to feed as well as heal the planet. It's, it's just remarkable. And so at the end, I said, if you ever want to, you know, come from wall street to Redwood Falls, Minnesota, we would be happy to host you. And I didn't actually think that they would take us up on that because they have very busy days. They have demanding jobs and lo and behold, we ended up having, I think it was eight different investment firms represented on Monday morning and we picked them up at their hotel at 10 a.m. and spent two hours on the bus and in the, for the full two hours, Kisa, Jay Watson on our team, that director of regenerative agriculture, didn't get to eat lunch on the bus. He had to stand and answer questions because they were so engaged. They had become prepared. They had done pre-reads that we had shared with them. We had, we had shared with them a couple of resources like um, Kiss the Ground, this is a movie that's on Netflix or Biggest Little Farm to help them just get a better sense of what we meant by regenerative agriculture and the potential outcomes that it is it can drive on the farm ecosystem. And I have to say, I was so pleased by the level of engagement, by the fact that they did their homework, they read these articles, they came prepared with questions and this deep curiosity to want to better understand this potential. And not only why General Mills is doing this, but why several other food companies and CPGs have set very similar commitments in the regenerative agriculture space. And it was just delightful to see them again, as that shovel full of healthy soil was held out in front of them, they got to touch aggregates, or they got to see a soil health demonstration where what there are four different types of soils. Some of it is just dirt that had, you know, dirt from maybe a garden, there was um, forestry, there was a, a little plot from a conventionally managed farm and then a regeneratively managed farm. And they simulated a rainstorm and the runoff from the regeneratively managed farm was almost zero because that soil was so healthy. It has great water holding capacity where, you know, other areas or, you know, dirt that would maybe be closer to maybe where we are or over tilled, over managed, all the runoff that came through and that fact that the water actually could not penetrate the soil it just ran off and took a lot of the soil with it it was just again helps you understand these concepts in such a powerful way when you can see what's actually happening to the, these natural ecosystems and and the soil and the health and water piece so we're talking about innovation within the agricultural area. Let's talk about the other types of innovative approaches that you all have taken in the past. You mentioned that this started in 2019 with the regenerative agriculture. I know in 2021, you all began some innovative approaches to financial structuring to exhibit your commitment to sustainability. In April, 2021, you had the first US CPG company to have a sustainability linked credit facility, which means you've received a pricing adjustment based on measure progress and reducing greenhouse gases, as well as using renewable energy. In, in October of the same year, there was a sustainability linked bond making you all the first US investment grade consumer packaged goods company to execute this type of green financing bond. So we have the innovation at the agricultural level and we also have the innovation at the financial level. Four years in from the 2019 region of agriculture, agriculture date and two years in to the financial structure, 
What are some current innovation themes, trends that your leadership team is engaging with now to improve on these sustainability efforts? Are you still really focused on farming? Are you focused more on the financial structuring? What's on the agenda today? I would say there are three big areas of focus. And I would say that these are our three priority commitment areas where we are investing, resourcing, building capabilities, putting people in place to ensure that we are seeing progress. Those are the reduction of our greenhouse gas emissions. So we have a commitment today to reduce our emissions by 30% across our full value chain by 2030. That's the first area. And I'm happy to talk a little bit more about some of the work that's happening within that space. The second priority area is around regenerative agriculture. And again, we're, we're 500,000 acres into a 1 million acre commitment and very, very excited to continue to see that progress and the, actually the momentum really building there. And the third area is around packaging. And there's a lot of really exciting innovation happening in the packaging space. I'm very, very proud of the work that the company has done up to this point. We have 92% of our packaging in North America and our food service business that is already recyclable or reusable. And, and that is something to be proud of when you think about the number of brands in that portfolio that already have recyclable materials and recyclable packaging. I think what I have learned in this role is that the last 10% of any public commitment, it, it can be a challenge. Low hanging fruit is gone. The easy wins are gone. Now it comes to getting really creative, engaging very, very smart people with technical expertise who are on the leading edge of things that maybe don't exist today, but there are promising pilots or promising new innovations that are developing. I am very, very grateful that we have an outstanding research and development team here at General Mills. We call them ITQ or Innovation, Technology, and Quality. And these are some of the most brilliant people that I've ever come across in my career. And they are helping the company to lead in packaging innovation. So that last 8% that we need to get to fully recyclable, they are partnering with suppliers, with new packaging companies, testing new materials that you would not have thought about before. Um, I, I read some things, you know, I, I follow, follow the packaging space very, very closely, just given that we have a major commitment in this area. And I'm seeing things like students developing packaging that are made out of fish gills that are now recyclable. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's, it's amazing to see the innovation and the creativity coming out of this space. I think when human beings are presented with really, really big challenges, but if we overcome them, we have the opportunity to drive such positive and lasting impact. There's creativity that just pours out in such different ways and the collaboration across these teams, whether they are brand teams trying to solve a consumer challenge or the packaging team is trying to really figure out how do we reduce the amount of plastic or even the amount of packaging overall. The creativity that comes through these cross collaborative groups is just very, very inspiring. So while that last 8% is not going to be easy for sure, I have no doubt that the right people are on it and that we will get there over time. And I, I think the biggest thing that we need right now is the time to continue to innovate, to test, to learn, to understand what doesn't work and when we fail fast, let's fail fast, let's learn, let's pivot and let's go on to the next piece. So in terms of, I, I get the last 10% being a challenge and that time is really critical. What about questions around cost? You get a lot of issues with, we love to do this, but the cost, the investment dollars, that's just a challenge to get. Is that an issue or do you think that that's not as much of an issue as the time piece? I think for, for us and from our perspective, because we've made these big ambitious commitments and our, our leaders are you know, holding our feet to the fire on these things. It's not so much the cost piece because over time they will figure out how to do holistic margin management and it won't affect the p &L. Yes, there's investors, upfront investments, but it is more the time. It, it is, we can have the financial resources and we're ready to go. And then we run a pilot and we find, ooh, that particular material actually isn't holding up the food safety standards that we need. So let's go back to the drawing board. How do we reinvest? How do we rescope the project to make sure that next time we come back to test that we can see progress within that particular area? So in, in talking about some of the standards that you need to meet, we all know that with CPG, it touches a lot of places. In your sustainability report, you talk about where you want to have a footprint, whether that's transparency and nutrition or food security, even employee safety all while generating revenue. So how do you integrate some of those core elements of sustainability into your firm's 
overall strategy while driving revenue? It's a great question. And what I would point to is a very thoughtful enterprise integration strategy. So this does not happen by accident. We start with the governing body and having the right governance structure in place. So here at General Mills, we have a committee called the Global Impact Governance Committee. Shorthand, we call it the GIGC. It is chaired by our CEO and most of his direct reports, including our chief strategy and growth officer, our chief financial officer, our head of our North American business, our head of our pet business, all sit at that table and they are the ones who are responsible for driving commitment advancement. It no longer rests on the sustainability or global impact team because those leaders are the ones with the decision-making authority on where to put investments, how fast or how slow we'll go, and, and, and to resolve business tensions when there are those. When you get, okay, I, I need to prioritize a plant trial versus keep running the plant. You know, there's those tensions that come up all the time, but if they know there's an enterprise goal, there's an enterprise the amount of progress that needs to happen in a given fiscal year, those leaders help drive the accountability within their own organizations to ensure that we are keeping pace with our overall commitment glide path. So I would say number one, it absolutely starts with the governance structure. The second piece is understanding what work needs to happen in what parts of the organization in order to drive progress. One of the biggest changes that we had in our last fiscal year is we've developed our greenhouse gas reduction plan. And as we got clarity on the jobs to be done, we changed how we are organizing within the sourcing organization. We've hired additional headcount there who are now solely responsible for advancing the sustainability greenhouse gas reduction goal. They are responsible for supplier engagement. They are collecting supplier greenhouse gas data. That didn't exist a few years ago, but as we got clarity of where the work needed to happen in order to make progress, and brought that forward to our leaders. They signed off on the approval. They gave us the resourcing, the headcount to understand unless sourcing is engaged here, we will not make progress in this area or unless the global energy team is here and knows the pace at which we need to be advancing to renewable electricity or renewable energies. The sustainability team can't do that. We are not the ones buying the energy. So there's been this clear understanding of who needs to do what and when which has made this process so much smoother. And not, it's not without its challenges, for sure. These business teams are under a lot of pressure. There's very, very high expectations to drive the PL, to drive innovation goals, to drive cost savings, to drive sustainability. And with, within their jobs, they are figuring out how to manage all of these things and balance those challenges. And when there are trade offs to be made or risks, they are elevated through up to that governance committee which has been just a great backstop in ensuring progress in these areas. So that integration piece has been absolutely key. And one of the other things that we have done is we've highlighted the key functions that play significant roles in advancing these commitments. It's not everybody in the company that, that jobs are changing. It's sourcing. It's our innovation technology and quality group. It's manufacturing. It's our brand teams and it's our business segment. So there's seven key areas within General Mills that have what are called integration champions. So they are kind of like the, it's like a hub and spoke. Our team is at the center and they are the connectivity into each of those business units or into each of those segments to clearly architect the roadmap by fiscal year of what work needs to be done. How are we measuring? How do we ensure it's in the scorecard? How do we know we're getting the right data? And how, how do we know that we're elevating on time? any risks that might put us off the annual plan. So it's been, it's been a very significant transformation at General Mills, and we would not be able to make progress unless we were at the same time advancing integration. I love that you mentioned the hub and spoke and that you're at the center of things. I'm wondering in terms of the sustainability function long-term, do you think that overall as the industry, having CSOs, having sustainability officers, is that sustainable or do you see a total integration of the sustainability function once we get to where we need to be? Do you see that being integrated into the business or do you always see there being a separate sustainability function after 2030, after 2050, when many of these firms have met the goals that they want to achieve? Personally, we are working to try to put ourselves out of a job because 
When this is fully integrated and done right across the company, it's just within the way that you operate. Are we there yet? No, we still have a lot of work to do. But I hope at some point within my lifetime that there is not a need for a separate team because it is integrated in every single aspect of the business. It's integrated at the board level. It's integrated in how you recruit employees. It's integrated in how you tell your responsibility story. It's integrated into financial planning. And, and maybe there will be still some type of center team providing support, but over time, I feel like we should have a family of 38,000 General Mills champions helping to advance this work, integrated as part of their day job. And, and there won't be hopefully this need for sustainability officers because we have figured out a way to operate in harmony with Mother Nature, within planetary boundaries, and still be able to feed uh, the, a growing global population sustainably. And as you know, right now, there is, particularly in the U.S., there's a lot of discussion around possible ESG policies as it relates to ESG being a part of investment decisions that investors consider ESG risks. And so with that said, what do you think are the most valued aspects of sustainability in the CPG industry? And what are the most undervalued aspects of sustainability in the CPG industry? Some of the most valued opportunities are the fact that we don't have companies, you know, you, you have a collection of CPG companies that have made regenerative agriculture commitments. So there, there's something here. And I think there is a lot of value when you get large companies that have scale, that have investment, that can put resources into a movement. There is such power in that, in that work. And I think if we can figure out as companies how we work together pre-competitively to contribute to those shared landscapes that we all care about and maybe worry in the future less about attribution or getting credit for what General Mills is doing or what my own company is doing. We all share this planet. We can, I think, if we can get our minds around ways to think about credit and collaboration, there is value in there that we have not fully realized yet. I, I think there's a desire. I think companies want to do the right thing. They want to work together. It's harder to actualize that desire on a farmscape. And, and I think if, if we can't make that change, I think we will isolate and perhaps frustrate farmers. If you have all of these companies and organizations going in and they've got 25 different programs to opt into, we're just going to overwhelm them. They, they've got huge jobs to do. And we need to figure out how do we as an industry and even more broadly, civil society, government come together to do this in a way that will drive true, lasting impact effectively and efficiently. So we've got, I think we have some work to do there, honestly, but I, I think that we can get there because I think that not only does the world need us to do this, People have very ambitious goals right now. And from what I can see, we need to act with a little bit more urgency than we are today. You really laid out some really great stories around how Jerome Mills has engaged investors in, in a very non-traditional way with the field trip. You've laid out stories around how Juno Mills is engaging farmers. So if you look at the entire stakeholder ecosystem, what does stakeholder engagement success around sustainability look like? And I know we talked about some internal stakeholders that you have there too, but when you say job well done, this is what a successful use case is. What does that look like to you? I would say it's different by stakeholder group. So first and foremost, I would say investors are incredibly important because they are the ones who are putting the pressure on disclosures. They want companies to act. I think that that group, giving them the more human, personal, real, like natural environment experience brings this work to life in a very, very different way. So I think the investor, like success for me is the fact that we had eight, you know, investment firms fly in from New York and spend a day in Redwood Falls, Minnesota. I mean, it was just, it was fantastic. That That's a, it's a lot to, to give up when you have those big jobs, but you could tell there was a different, again, appreciation and understanding. I wish I could give every investor on the planet that experience to be on a regenerative farm because it really is, it really is totally eye-opening and mind-blowing. And I think 
just all of a sudden things click. It makes sense and you understand why this is such an important opportunity that we have in front of us. I would say then for employees, it's a little bit different. If we are retaining and attracting amazing talent who day after day, I get new employees coming into my office telling me I came to General Mills because of the regenerative agriculture commitment, or I came in because of the amount of food that this company has donated to Feeding America and I've seen what it did for my community. It matters, this work matters. And, and com employees expect companies to one, be doing good, but to two, they wanna work for companies where their values are aligned. And I love the fact that this newer generation of employees who are coming in care so much about the planet. They're informed, they're educated on issues. They seek out on their own opportunities within their roles to help do better. And I have, a, I have a lot of hope for the future when I see leaders like that, young leaders like that coming in and demonstrating what they can do and how they're thinking so differently. Speaking of the future, leaders of the future, share your two to five year vision of where you would like to see your company specifically, but the industry more broadly. We know that there are some goals out there. Do you have a clear vision about where you want to see things in terms of the sustainability landscape? Absolutely. In, in two to five years, I hope, and I don't know how this will happen, but I hope the world figures out how to get out of scope three gridlock. It is a mm -hmm. very real challenge today. So at General Mills, we have made tremendous progress on our greenhouse gas emissions reductions in scope one and scope two. So things that are within our own control. We have reduced our scope one and scope two emissions by 49% since 2020. I mean, huge, huge progress. Yet our scope three emissions are static. They're not moving yet. We're, we're buying more ingredients, we're selling more product. And it's very challenging when you're talking about this emissions that are coming at a farm level or emissions that are coming when a consumer is baking a cake at home. We have to figure out how we influence areas that we do not have direct control over. And how do we help to influence policy? We've got a great partnership with our government affairs team here at General Mills who is constantly, constantly advocating and working on our behalf to help advance climate friendly, climate smart policies and helping to elevate things that may not be working today and might, might be barriers for farmers to move to regenerative agriculture. So there are many things that we need to influence over the next several years in order to see success. I hope and I actually believe within the next five years we will achieve our regenerative agriculture goal. I hope all of our peers do the same. I hope we knock those numbers out of the park before 2030. Again, because I think Mother Nature needs us to do that to help reverse some of the things that we're starting to see when it comes to either warming temperatures, more extreme weather events, or degrading ecosystems. I hope in three to five years that we don't have stats like the fact that more than 800 million people are hungry. I hope we figure out how to improve the food system. I hope that we reverse some of the trends we're seeing with pollinator decline, and that with some of these changes, we actually see this resurgence as Mother Nature regenerates. It's incredibly powerful how she can heal herself when given the opportunity to do so. Um, and, and I hope that we have made some meaningful changes in that space so that our children and our grandchildren and the next generation of leaders who are sitting in this seat when I'm not here are not dealing with the same set of issues, but rather are working on uh, things that are a little bit more promising and a little more hopeful when it comes to ecosystem health. Finally, you named three priority areas that you have right now. First of all, bringing GHG emissions down 30%. Um, the next one, the regener regenerative agriculture, which is a theme throughout, and also packaging. I want you to tell us something that we didn't know about the future of the industry. And it could be in those three primary areas. I know you're researching that right now, but tell us something that we did not know that you'd be privy to based on the research and what you're finding and what is standing out for you. I would say what I did not know was how farmers resonate so much with other farmers bringing these practices to life and the challenges that they are facing within their own communities because they are doing something that is so different than the way maybe their parents or their grandparents had managed the farm and some of the societal or social pressure or even you know, being ostracized in their community. We had this farmer on Monday talk about 
the changes that he was making to his landscape meant that he didn't have straight rows of corn and soybeans. His farm was messy because he had many, many things growing, you know, oats and all kinds of other things growing on his farm. And when he would go into the coffee shop on Saturday morning, his neighbors would not speak to him because they thought he had kind of lost it and didn't know why he wasn't keeping his farm clean and why did he have all these other things growing there. And he said socially it was very hard. He felt very isolated. So this farmer connectivity and the farmer social support that our research and development team, in fact, it was our soil scientist who created this private face group uh, page or group for the farmers who are in our pilots and the support that they're providing for one another, the council, the safe space to have a conversation about how do you handle this when your neighbors aren't talking to you or people think that you know you're not you're not farming in the way that you you should be and something's something's not right. That support has meant more for those farmers than I appreciated when I first started hearing the feedback in 2020 about what the farmers were experiencing. So I think a very holistic support approach for farmers is needed as they make these pretty significant changes to their farms. And we talk a lot about worker engagement, showing your workers, your employees, that you value them, that you respect them, that you're committed to them. And this is a clear example of supply chain, your suppliers, your vendors, those who who are in your supply chain and really showing them how much you want to see them succeed and advocate for them. And thus a good example of that. So, so much here from talking about your innovation with regenerative agriculture, talking about your engagement with stakeholders, whether that's the shareholders um, that you engage in some non-traditional ways, which is great, um, as well as farmers and also your commitments and really how to drive those commitments from developing the governing body to understanding who really needs to do what work in the organization to moving forward and understanding how to progress and how to see things advance. So much going on and I am looking forward to our next conversation. Mary Jane Melendez, CSO at General Mills. Thank you so much, Mary Jane. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Thanks for joining us on today's episode of Climate Money Work. Please follow the show wherever you're listening right now. If you have any questions, feedback, or pitches, please get in touch with the team at cmw at shrugcontent.com. Again, that's cmw at shrug, S-H-R-U-G, content.com. Now you can learn more about the show at kisashreen.com forward slash podcast. You can find me on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. I'm Kisa Shreen and thank you for listening. Be well.